everybody. This is Audrey Moore with the Audrey Helps Actors Podcast, and this is episode 116, Casting Director Tell All with Jessica Sherman. Woo! Jessica! Okay, Jessica is a casting director who has worked on shows and movies like Bates Motel, Willow, and Star Wars The Force Awakens. The Force isn't asleep. It awakened with Jessica's help. She's also the founder of A Cause for Entertainment. We discuss self-taping tips from a casting director and the impact of self-tapes on casting decisions, advice on auditioning for different roles and the significance of understanding the character. And we fake cast a live action version of Inside Out to give you insight into who is best for a role and why. I mean, a really great conversation if I do say so myself. Self-Tape May! Congratulations to everyone who finished any tapes during Self-Tape May. Congratulations to everyone who finished 16 tapes and super duper congratulations to the random winner I'm about to announce who finished 16 tapes and who has won our prize package consisting of a one year premium subscription to Casting Networks, a one year subscription to castability.actor, a free coaching session with self tapes here, Jeff Pride, access to Stan Kirsch Studios, become a self tape pro masterclass, Amy Linden's The Linden Technique 15 Guideline Map to Booking Saturday Intensive, a general meeting with casting director Helen Geyer, and an invitation to be on the Audrey Helps Actors Podcast. Woo! Yeah! And the winner is Natalie J. Keezer 118. Congratulations! This week, the review baby is being fed by no one. Why do you starve the review baby? When you take 20 seconds to go on to ratethispodcast.com slash Audrey, you are giving me a piece of love and affirmation and validation that my mother never gave me. And I just think that we should take that a little seriously. Doesn't it sound like a happy little gift to give to me? In fact, here's my promise. If you send me a review this week, I'm going to take a screenshot of that review and without any context, I'm going to text it to my mother. I'm just going to text it to her without any context whatsoever. Doesn't that sound fun? It really does help us and it feeds the review baby, which is really the deep, sad hole in my heart of a lack of my mother's bond and love. So thank you so much in advance. You just go to ratethispodcast.com slash Audrey. That's all you have to do. RateThisPodcast.com slash Audrey. This week's podcast is brought to you by Casting Networks. Go to CastingNetworks.com slash Audrey and use promo code AudreyCN for $65 off a premium annual membership. Boo, 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 boo. I love giving you money. It's my favorite thing. All right. I hope you're on your way to an audition. I hope you book it. I hope you got that audition from Casting Networks. You're going to go book a big job and that you got that audition because of your $65 off your premium annual membership. So who's Audrey helps actors because they don't know anything. So hi, everybody. I'm Audrey Moore with the Audrey Helps Actors podcast. And today we have Jessica Sherman. Jessica, hey girl. Hello. Hi. How's it going? I'm thrilled that you're here, mostly because we are doing like a podcast blend today. Those of you who are not aware, you are a cast director and host of Tipsy Casting. And tell everyone what happens on Tipsy Casting. We drink and talk casting. (laughs) So here we are. So here we are. So we're going to do a little drinking and talking about casting. Yeah. Yay. Cheers. Cheers. Thrilled. Mm. Okay. So I want to tell everyone about how outstanding you are. So let me just love on you. You have been a casting director in town. Well, you're born and raised in LA. Let's start there. Mm -hmm. I have a special place in my heart for people born and raised here. I really do. Two, you have been casting for several decades now. Yes. 15 years. About 15 years. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Survivor. (laughs) Okay. Wonderful. And you came up with a legend under the 
sort of tutelage and mentorship of a legend. Do you want to tell them who? Yes, April Webster and Alyssa Weisberg. Can't forget about her. Let's not. Yes. Let's not ever. Yeah. Great. <laughs> okay. And you have cast tons of the best shows, the best pilots. You are currently wrapping on a project we won't tell them about. And congratulations to you, you on all of that. Working right now is... I knew I can get a job, you guys. Yeah. I mean, just along with everybody else, it was rough last it's, year, to say the least. It's been a rough couple of years, yes. guys. This is going to be a little rough. Yeah. I feel very fortunate. I am really thrilled for you when, I, when you told me the news. You also are one of the most capable people okay. I know. And people don't know the sort of 360 multidimensional version of all that you do that is really valuable. And so I would just like to uh, shout some of that out. So first of all, you founded and created A Cause for Entertainment, which is to help and support people with cancer in ways that are sort of maybe a little sneaky. So do you want to talk about that? What do you mean sneaky? Well, like it's the <laughs> sneaky expenses. It's the sneaky yes. things that like you don't know about. The sneaky expenses is, you know, the parking when you go for chemo, the child care, like all of those little things that we don't think about mm -hmm. that it's part of the treatment process yes. and, and all of that. So I was involved with a number of organizations on a larger scale that were the big organizations, the Avon Foundation. And while they do great work, they have a lot of overhead. And I realized that there's a ton of money that doesn't end up with the people that need it mm -hmm. wholly. Mm -hmm. And so when I started A Cause for Entertainment, my goal was one, that we keep our overhead low, two, that we're 100% volunteer, and three, that we help fund this small boots on the ground organizations that do the day to day work. And so that's what we've been doing. And this year is our 10th anniversary. This year is your 10th? Yeah, in October. Do you have a date yet for your Not yet. Event? I've got two venues that I'm sort of trying to get at the lowest possible price. <laughs> I'm so excited. Now, I am not rich enough to be a part of it in the rich way, but I would love to help in whatever way yeah. would be helpful to you. I'm also looking for the rich people as well. Yeah, if you're listening in <laughs> rich, which I know some of you are, this is a beautiful cause. And I just want to talk about my own personal experiences with the sneaky things about cancer. I have unfortunately had a lot of encounters with cancer in my life not me personally actually I just got cancer removed <gasps> hey oh, wow. I knew she was coming she was no surprise mm -hmm. I've been waiting for her my whole life there she was but now I have had a lot of people in my life who have passed mm -hmm. from cancer and who have struggled with the cancers yeah and it is such a relentless experience. Mm. And it really is, I find, I want to get like really emotional, the pockets of people that are helping in ways that you didn't even know you were going to need help. Yeah. And these people reach out or are reachable and do the things that you just don't have the bandwidth for, whether that's emotional or financial or physical. Mm -hmm. And I just think that what you do in recognizing these little sneaky expenses and these inconveniences on top of what is already an extremely traumatizing process yeah. is so kind and so generous. And so thank you so much for the work that you do thank you. on behalf of not just the entertainment industry, but on behalf of anyone who has and will need help when they undergo their own experiences. Yeah. So thank you. Oh, it's our pleasure. Honestly, my dream of dreams for a cause for entertainment is not just to be able to write a check mm -hmm. at the end of the day, but to build a network of support for people. Mm -hmm. So basically anyone who is a survivor or a caretaker to connect them with people who are newly diagnosed. Because mm. at the end of the day, everybody's medical journey is very different. Right. But if you can have an ounce of support mm -hmm. at the beginning of it mm. to know what you're about to face, I think it makes it a little less scary. So we're slowly building into that space, but we're, you know, we're definitely looking for a network of people who are interested in participating too. Rich people. <laughs>
I love rich people. They're my favorite. I just love them. So yes, thank you so much for that. I just had an experience with a friend of mine whose dad underwent this catastrophic treatment. It was my best friend's father. And I was there for her as I know to be because I know somebody has to caretake the caretaker. Yeah. And she couldn't believe how much she didn't know and was so appreciative of just the little things I was able to show up for and with that she didn't even know she would need because you don't if you've not been through it before. So if you are interested, if you would like to volunteer, if you know rich people, contact A Cause for Entertainment. It's a really beautiful program. So thank you. Thank you. Also, you save so many dogs. And let's talk about how anyone who saves dogs, you know, I'm here for it. Like there's a thing about dogs and how much I love them and you do too. So tell everyone about your advocacy for all of our sweet pups. I mean, I grew up with dogs. They have the largest part of my heart. And my first experience of rescuing is finding a German Shepherd on Betty White's birthday (gasps) in 2021. One, I believe. So I knew it was Kismet Mm -hmm. and in Mitzvah. And he was barking at me for two hours. And I tried to wrangle him and eventually did. And then tried to get him placed and had to fight another rescue that I entrusted him with to get him back. Yes, he was in a kennel for almost a year. Oh, my God. We got him back. He's got a home now. He's very, very happy. And in that process, I started fostering another dog Uh that I don't know if you know Lauren White, but she tagged me on Instagram saying, oh, my God, he looks just like Lucy, who's my other rescue dog. And the rescue reached out to me asking me to repost the post because this was Saturday at 730 a.m. And they said that he'd been red listed and his deadline was 930 a.m. And so I started asking a bunch of questions. I reposted it and basically said, if nobody comes... To, I'll take yeah, I'll take him as a foster. Then I fostered him for 10 months. Oh. And then I just adopted him. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. So now we're a family of three. Yay. <laughs> it is a very happy thing. And I'm really glad that you were surrounded by so much sweet pups and so much love over there. And anyone who's posting about helping and saving these little puppers or cats, I'm here for all of it. It also tells me something about you. Yeah. There's a photographer in town who's like kind of grumpy, but his profile picture is a fluffy little white little dog Mm -hmm. and so when I tell people I'm like so I think you should shoot with this photographer he's a little grumpy but I just want you to know in his soul he's he's a Pomeranian totally (laughs) you you know who I'm talking about don't you okay but it is a Pomeranian (laughs) yeah okay great so that's what it is Um, speaking of photographers I just want to shout out her name is Diane London okay and during the strike she donated ice cream social shoots for people affected by the strike that wanted to spark joy for them, for their pets. And so I went and I took Tux to her. This was right when I started fostering him, thinking it'll get him adopted faster to see his personality. And they're just the most gorgeous photos. I think I saw this. Yeah. You posted it. I think she still does these ice cream socials, but they cost. Sure. But I want to support her because of what she was doing. It was really great. Yeah. Anyone who um, helped and volunteered and gave aid and love and support during the strike has Mm -hmm. got like a green light for me. Yeah. Also, I just want everyone to know that you are sexy and single (laughs) and ready to mingle. And the fact that you're still single is just crazy town (laughs) to me because you're banging. You're smart. Thank you. You are funny and you get shit done. And so if you are a a gentle fellow out there and you're like, she just sounds so great because she is, and you too would like to have a lot of dogs and a lot of love (laughs) in your life, I bet you can find Jessica on several different mediums. You're going to be my new dating service. I would love to be. Who needs Bumble? (laughs) You don't. No. Just me. Clearly not. Well, cheers to no Bumble. Cheers to no Bumble. (laughs) Very good. Okay. So... I have covered a lot of topics so far this season that is getting a lot of chatter, I feel like, online. And I just want some casting perspective because people are always in a panic, right? Yes. Actors, as you know, always in a panic. So tell me about dressing for a role. Has anyone in your 15 years of casting ever worn an outfit that was so far 
that it lost them the role? And then what size was that role and how far was that outfit? I've definitely seen a number of these situations, mm-hmm. but in the self tape space, it's becoming less of a concern. Mm-hmm. Usually the roles are smaller. Mm-hmm. It's more of the co-star space or smaller supporting roles. Mm-hmm. But the things that you'll see, if it's a medical role, then you'll see the lab coat. If it's a cop, I've seen so many people dress in full regalia. What ends up happening is that if you're not right for one of these roles, mm-hmm. there's less possibility that we might be like, oh, they're better suited for the teacher. I see. You know, so. But then again, what size role are we talking about? So it's like, more, so I think. It, like one day guest star, co-star roles? Or I mean, typically, I'll say what I've seen the most mm-hmm. is people get too specific in the co-star space. Great. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. When most people are auditioning for guest stars and series regulars, mm-hmm. it's more in the tone mm-hmm. of the role versus the specificity of it. Right. So if it's a professional character, then you dress professionally. If it's casual, you're a bit more casual. But to dress to the nines, I think, can be distracting at times. Great. Now, have you had a actor who did a fantastic performance and another actor who did a fantastic performance and had the director feel like the actor that really went for the character in terms of look, they felt like it was amateurish of them because they did that? I don't know that it was vocalized. Uh-huh. uh-huh. <laughs> um, this is the thing. It's not, there's not a blanket statement. Exactly. Because the preference, yeah. right? Like some directors are like, who cares? Yeah. And some directors are like, I don't need a lab coat, you guys. I can tell you this. I was working on Believe. It was a mm. pilot, Believe. And Alfonso Cuaron was directing the pilot. And we were looking for the little girl in the pilot that was going to be the lead of the whole series, yeah. essentially. And what he did, I'd never had another director do it before. But he came in the day before, he set up the lighting himself, Mm. he set up the camera himself, Mm. and he had us go to like a kid's clothing shop and buy several of different sizes of the same exact shirt. Oh, see, that's so smart. Isn't it? Like, I'd never seen anybody else do it. So they were all working on the same scale. And I'd never seen that before. And I haven't seen it since. Yeah, that's interesting. They do that a lot in commercial casting because... What a lot of cast directors would find is that if it was a Best Buy commercial Mm -hmm. and then these three people wore their blue polos Mm -hmm. and everyone else wore whatever, then every time the three polos got it Mm -hmm. and they were like, can we just not? And so then they started telling people wear a blue polo, right? Because they just want it to be as much about the acting as possible But what I love about what you just said is he was really looking for the work and not to be influenced by the other art forms that do influence a performance, but really look at the actor and see like, how's this going? Yeah. I mean, I dream of those situations, honestly. (laughs) That's really beautiful. So in terms of serious regulars, I'm gonna tell you a story and you tell me if I fucked up, okay? (laughs) Okay. So I auditioned for a serious regular for ER, great role, not my part. I didn't think it was like the doctor that comes in later in life and has like this dark past in history. And I was like, no one's hiring me (laughs) for my dark past in history. Like that's part of my evolution of the Mm -hmm. story. So I did my thing and I did wear my lab coat and scrubs and I had the props that I would use because for me, I feel in character. Mm -hmm. And so is someone going to look at that and go like, ah, Audrey, what up? fucking tool like girl I don't Audrey. think so I think at the end of the day it's the performance you dressed into the tone of it but as long as you're not like going way overboard which I don't feel like I mean I go overboard all the time but that's part of my personality <laughs> but I would say but not in a space where it's distracting from your performance that's my hope I mean my hope is that what I'm doing is being like I'm an actor I'm in character. I have these things. And I'm aware that they may be like, why does she own that lab coat? And I'm like, well, I've been an actor <laughs> yeah, like for everybody owns the lab years. Coat. I don't know what to tell you, right? Also, I find a lot of life in behavior. And the outfit often gives me a lot of behavior in addition to props, right? So that I'm not just like doing what you see. I know you see a lot of actors do, which is like kind of acting like it's a monologue. Mm. You know, like they just kind of stand there and don't really move. To me, I'm seeing in book self-tapes. I don't know if you've seen any of the book self-tapes I posted, but so much environment 
involved and props and movement and costume really I find help for environment and so I just wondered like as a person who is auditioning for these larger roles but I have obviously a resume and footage that I think shows my qualifications and skills does it look stupid no great (laughs) I don't think it looks stupid. I think, again, if the performance Mm -hmm. is there, it's not going to matter what you're wearing as long as it's not a distraction from your performance. Right. And the same thing in terms of environmental stuff. Right now we're in a position, we're watching a lot of self-tapes. Our jobs, which I'm not particularly happy about, but our jobs have changed in nature. Our job is not no longer to mine the performance and collaborate with the actor. Ours is now being media managers and trying to find a spark in a self-tape, yeah. which is very hard. Yeah, because self-tapes are innately very boring. Like the writer didn't write the scene to be an exciting self-tape. Yeah. The writer wrote the scene for sound and camera angles and different facial reactions and music. If they wanted to write a scene that would be an exciting scene inside a box that doesn't go anywhere, they would write a different scene. Yeah. It's about the scene, but it's also about the fact that we're not working in offices. We're Mm -hmm. working at home. There's a level of distraction that's innately in our environment. So real. And so... It's not only about the performance, but it is keeping our attention Mm -hmm. to a degree. Mm -hmm. Like we can immediately tell when an actor starts this audition thinking, okay, this is what I think a casting director is looking for versus this is what I'm bringing my interpretation of this character. And just coming off of this project that I was working on, I mean, normally we switch up the material midway through the casting process because, you know, there's no coffee can for casting. You can't cleanse the palate. (laughs) You know, so I think a big part of it is we start to see auditions that everyone's having the same beats and it's very monotonous and you're realizing that nobody's actively making it their own. And on this project I was working on, we encouraged people to improvise. I encouraged people to call me and schedule sessions to talk about the character Mm. before. There were so many people that did not take me up on it. Mm. But the thing that you start to notice is the people that are using their environment, Mm -hmm. the people that are creating tension coming closer to the camera, you know, whatever that might be. I think those things set a self-tape apart from everyone that's just sitting in frame. But also not as a gimmick. Right. There's an understanding that there is an environment here and in getting a little closer because you're having like an intimate moment with somebody on the side, like a Shakespearean aside, right, is going to inherently make the image more interesting and fulfill the truth of that moment Mm -hmm. because it's an intimate aside actually in the script than not having that action and taking what might feel like a risk or feel... Um, really big to an actor. Yeah. Right. But I also think, and I don't encourage actors to spend money, like that's not my thing. Mm -hmm. But I will say like for the thing that I just worked on, I didn't want to do the heavy labs. I didn't want all the cables. And I literally just bought the tiniest mic kit. I mean, Mm -hmm. those tiny things Mm -hmm. that you can get from Amazon for like 20, 30 bucks. The idea of creating immediacy with your voice Mm -hmm. is valuable, I believe. So glad you did that. And so... Because like, you were reading with them. I wasn't, but I had, a, I had an actor great. read with Love. them because I don't want to mess Wonderful. anybody up. Sure, great. But that was making a difference because they can create quiet moments and it wasn't too quiet, you know, and you still know your volume and create the intensity when you need to. So I think it's finding what makes sense to you versus trying to check the boxes. Because it's an art form. Yeah. And, and that's going to change whether it's a one line, two line co-star versus something that's more substantial. That's right. But it's knowing the purpose of your character and what mm-hmm. What your choices serve the character for. But then we're getting into a whole other thing. To me, that really gets into mastery of the audition process, which is just slightly adjacent to the mastery of being an actor. Be a great actor in commercial first calls and then fall apart every time in the callback. Yeah. You can be an actor who's like barely shows up in the audition for the first call, but then in the callbacks, you improvise the hell out of it and you crush every time. And that's different than doing a one hour streaming video on demand, limited series, dramatic self tape for somebody who's been a playwright for the last 12 years. Oh yeah. And even like from the writer's perspective, we had a writer, one of the series that I worked on, most of her experience 
experience was on stage. Mm -hmm. Like she was a, a playwright. Mm -hmm. And so the scenes that she would write were a mouthful for, yeah, for, right. for screen actors. And so there was a lot of going back to the writer mm -hmm. and being like, listen, all of the actors are having trouble with this. Maybe we should refine it a little bit. Just a smidge. Just a smidge. <laughs> Especially in TV when it's a long running experience. But it's also, you know, when actors would be in the room. Yes. Right. We could say, don't worry about this. Everyone is stumbling over this. Just make it make sense for yourself. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's fine because we have communicated that to mm -hmm. the team, you know? So, mm -hmm. and I think it's the thing that I feel like all casting directors understand is getting the job and doing the job are two different skill sets. Absolutely. It's the practice. It's mm -hmm. your self-tape may. It's mm -hmm. all of these things mm -hmm. that make you stronger. Mm -hmm. But I hope that we are getting to a point as things start to move forward mm -hmm that we will be in a position to offer actors the choice of being in the room or self-taping mm -hmm. because that's what it was before and it should be again. And I've started hearing whispers of some casting directors going back in person, mm -hmm. like the understanding that everybody thrives in a different environment. That's right. And if we can give people options, mm -hmm. why not? Yeah. People ask me all the time about self-tapes versus in-person. And I'm like, I don't know, six and one half dozen the other. Like there were great things about being in person. And then there were things about being in person that made you want to smash your face against the wall. And there are great things about self-tapes. And then there's like a lot of things about self-tapes that are upsetting. But I will tell you, one of the greatest things to come out of the strikes, and I will say it a billion times for the next however many years until we renegotiate, I didn't realize how traumatized I was by the self-tape turnaround mm -hmm. until now it has been changed. The reality is that I get 48 hours and it doesn't include weekends and that there's an eight page cap on it has taken me out of a fight or flight that I didn't even realize how deeply I was in mm -hmm. because my whole life was centered around managing my day in case someone was about to shoot me with an audition. And how am I going to be ready and have my energy and have my team set and have things ready so that I can be competitive? Like today, if I got an audition and you and I were scheduled for this, yeah. Like I have time to put the tape on tape, mm -hmm. whereas I would not feel comfortable doing this this time last year because I would feel like I'm going to get an audition and I'll spend the entire week yeah. panicked that the moment I'm going to have this chat with you, I'm going to get an audition of a lifetime and have to turn it in by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. I honestly, I don't understand the casting directors that were doing that to actors. I can't exclusively say that it was casting directors. I don't think it, it was. could be representation that is delayed. Like it was production. Well, I, I understand if like things are happening at the 11th hour, because that is still part of the stipulation. Yeah. Like if it's an immediate thing that's happening, yeah. you can create a shorter deadline. Mm -hmm. But that should be so infrequent. Mm -hmm. I think there are productions that are notorious for that, mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. But that shouldn't be the majority. Mm -mm. And I have casting friends that are married to actors. Yes. And I hear these things of like, oh, they got an audition for a series regular that's due tomorrow morning. Yeah. And there's no reason that should happen. No. Obviously, I don't know all of the points of negotiation mm -hmm. that they settled on for your contracts. Mm -hmm. But I think this was the best thing that could have come out of it because... Nobody should be doing 12 pages on the first call. Unnecessary. So unnecessary. Like when they first put the ban on indie productions. Uh -huh. I was like, why? We don't do it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I know. That's it's right. usually the procedurals. It I is. Found. Yeah. Procedurals, pilots. Yeah. Yeah. Things that are like going. Yeah. And they're like, ah. And as somebody who is in a level of auditioning that is getting those 12 pages or whatever and great opportunities, but they had to be in immediately. And also, like, I know about production. I like you. I'm like, what's happening? It's counterproductive. It's counterproductive for everyone. Yeah. And again, I agree with you. Like, there are instances where it's necessary, but not to the degree to which it was my life. Yeah. No. Yeah. But wait, Jessica. Wait, you incredibly kind, generous person, you. Also, so banging. I have to interrupt you. Help me. I need some help. And now it's time for Listener Questions. I'm so scared. This listener question is brought to you by Casting Networks. 
Casting Networks is where more professional roles are booked than any other casting service. It is used by more than 1,000 of the world's biggest casting directors, the world's global membership with a premium membership you can submit yourself to unlimited roles connect with agents and managers through talent scout talent scout get it upload 3.5 gigabytes of media track your submissions with role tracker and access to thrive thrive which provides unlimited access to telemedicine and behavioral services Network pharmacy discounts and home testing discounts. OMG, if health isn't important, I don't know what is. We're offering a $65 off a premium annual membership. Use the code AudreyCN. When you check out instructions on how to redeem the offer can be found at castingnetworks.com slash Audrey. That's castingnetworks.com slash Audrey. Use the promo code AudreyCN for $65 off a premium annual membership. Call us! Questions at 667-ACTOR-70. Call us with your stories, your wins, your trials, your tribulations, your thoughts. I like it. So many of you have had incredible wins and experiences through this self-tape made process. I want to hear about them. I also want, like, if you guys have something super weird that happened to you in an audition, I want to hear that too. Like, I want the dirt. I want the hot goss. I want it. Give it to me. Leave me a voicemail. 667-228-6770. Hi, Audrey. I'm calling from Los Angeles, and I wanted to ask about how you deal with this pressure to be thin for female actresses. I feel like I'm really feeling this right now, and there's just so much, like, ozempic noise in the news, and there's just so much happening right now that's, like, women need to be thin, especially amongst actors and actresses and people in entertainment and Hollywood in general. And I was just wondering what your journey is on that and if you have any tips for young actors on that. Thank you so much for everything that you do. You've helped me enormously and you're the best. Bye. OMG, I have so many thoughts about this. My biggest thought is, what is it, 1992? What's happening? What is going on? Why? 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 Okay, here's the thing. All bodies are welcome. All bodies tell all great stories. I am starving. I am starving as an audience member for more representation of all body types, all ages, all shapes and sizes. And this whole let's just be a size double zero like it's 1992 is just so weird. And I want you to know it's temporary. And you know what is super not helpful is on top of all the other things that you are worried about, thinking that you have to then spend extra amounts of time, energy, money, mental bandwidth obsessing about your body shape. Let's not. I'm going to have Jesse post this incredible video from the one, the only Emma Thompson, who does this great interview on late night television about obsessing about our weight and obsessing about how we look and what a giant tragedy of a waste that is of all of our talents and mental capacity and space. I can't tell you the number of actors that I have met through my whole life who have said, I don't know, I just wish people would tell me like, if I need to lose weight, just like tell me I need to lose weight. And I think it's just really sad and terrible. And here's what I would say to you. If you had a child, a son or daughter, if you could picture your son or daughter and they had your body type, would you tell them that their body type wasn't worthy of storytelling? That their body type wasn't worthy of of being on screen? I bet not. 
And so I think it is an unfortunate recurrence of advertising and trying to sell you shit. Like, no joke, you guys, companies are panicked because people are not buying things. They're panicked. And they're like, millennials, where is your money? And millennials are like, oh, we don't have any. You didn't pay us anything. And then we're in $300,000 of college debt. And they're like, but I need you to buy stuff. And we're like, I would love to buy stuff, but I cannot. And so that's part of the thing with trends. Is it's just another way to sell you shit. And so do you want to buy into that? And do you want to lose your mental and emotional financial, spiritual relationship health because of somebody's greedy advertising ploy to get you to change your shit so that you can buy more of their shit? Uh, no, don't do it. My point of view is I love bodies of shapes and sizes. Men, women, all genders. I think it's so refreshing when I see a story of somebody in a role and they look different than maybe the network television stereotype of that kind of character. I think it's so delicious. So that's what I have to say. If you are struggling with an eating disorder, and many people are, I encourage you to get a lot of help. It's a really bad place to be in. So I encourage you to seek help, go to the Entertainment Community Fund. They've got a lot of really wonderful resources. And watch this link. Emma, I mean, who's better? Nobody. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. So there's been all this drama mm -hmm. on the socials that I created about fake hair because every single trailer I'm in, everyone is wearing hair except for me. Every single actor mm -hmm. is wearing a hair piece, male or female, except for me. And so I started thinking like, well, I think this is bullshit then. Like, why is it that actors are like, well, this is the one look I have. So if it's not the look that you're looking for, then you don't cast me. And I also know tons of actors that wear wigs and book. I wear wigs and book, but the actor community is like panicked about like, well, what do I do? Do I wear a wig in my audition? Do I tell everyone that I'm in a wig? Do I wear a wig in my headshots? And if I wear a wig in my headshots, but then you call me in for a role that I think doesn't match the wig, then do I need to wear a wig for that audition because that's the headshot that you chose? Do I tell my agent I wore a wig? Like there's all the drama. Do yeah. you care? I mean, I think there's also a difference between a good wig and a bad wig. So if it's a bad wig, it could be distracting. Yes. And again, that's an additional expense that maybe mm -hmm. you don't need to spend money on. Right. I come from it from more that perspective. Yeah. Again, whatever you can do in your self tapes to not call attention to anything else, Other but to the focus work. the perf on the performance. Mm -hmm. I think when you start overthinking it, like yes. I'd like to think that we can use our imagination. Mm -hmm. That if a blonde woman auditions for a thing that's written as a brunette it's not set in stone right you know yes and if they want to change your hair they'll ask they'll ask and they do right and they do and they have really expensive wigs to do it with yes <laughs> so i think unless it feels authentic mm -hmm. to you or mm -hmm. it is a good wig yes that's right i think don't overthink it Right. Now, what if somebody is doing like a scene where they've been like beat up, right? Mm -hmm. You know, all these procedurals where they're like tied to the chair and they've been like beating your face, right? And so now in the era of cell tapes, which you wouldn't have done in the room, people are like, I'm going to give myself a little bit of a black eye. I'm going to give myself a little bit of blood. And it's not like a Tarantino level of blood, <laughs> but it's just like a little bit to like help the believability. Mm -hmm. Do you care? No, I think that's fine. Great. Okay. Just so everybody knows. You're one casting director. Yes. I would just like to point out one casting director who's worked with legends and is still working <laughs> with legends and is a legend herself. Because we've gotten a lot of people who've been like, what do you think? And I'm like, well, I can tell you what I think, but I'm not yeah. a casting director. I'm just a fellow actor yeah. who works a lot in a lot of trailers and sees what's going on. Yeah. But I just think it's whatever the bottom line is, as long as it's not overboard, as long as it's not going to distract, that's what you have to sort of toe that line right or I guess straddle that line right that you know th we need to be able to focus and if there's too much happening mm -hmm. it will distract 
yeah, I mean, does it feel like it is helping inform the story or does it feel like it is a gimmick that you are trying to use because somebody told you where wigs? I mean, it depends on the performance because I think sometimes people use all the elements as a distraction. Mm -hmm. That's right. As something to hide behind. That's right. So it's going to depend on the actor. It's going to depend on the situation. Mm -hmm. But I can say that casting directors, I think we've seen enough self-tapes over the years yeah. at this stage yeah, right. that like we can use our imagination. We can. But sometimes for our producers, when we send selects, because we're not in the same room with them, mm -hmm. because sometimes we never meet them yes. in person. Yes. We don't know what they're distracted by. We don't know what they're enticed by, mm -hmm. especially if it's a new relationship. Like we're still figuring it out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we don't have the ability to have those conversations with them, because sometimes they don't have time for us. Yes. Which is really shitty, but yeah, it's a reality. It's common. Yeah. yeah. And that's, you know, for us, it's like we want to set you up to have the most successful opportunity, the most, the biggest sh chance at it. That's the thing that I would really like. If I could just get everyone to understand what it is that you do, it's that, I, th you know, I know cast directors and agents get s like this weird rep, but in my experience, just like actors, once you get to like a level, right, where you're a professional, mm -hmm. people know who you are and you get good jobs and people have respect for your skill set. You're such advocates and creative collaborators, and that's what you want to be. And you are not the gatekeepers, the naysayers, the mean kids <laughs> at the table squad. Yeah. It's like casting is not getting paid that executive producer money <laughs> to be like the mean kids at the table. Like, yeah. You really are wanting to push us forward as advocates. Yes, there does have to be a level of gatekeeping if mm -hmm. we're going to call it that, mm -hmm. because we need to be specific with our time. Mm -hmm. And we don't want mm -hmm. you as an actor to waste your time either. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is the biggest thing that has been such a struggle mm -hmm. in the moment of now, mm -hmm. especially with reps, the lack of respect they have for our creative opinion. And that no doesn't mean no. The no means we're going to go around you. Mm -hmm. And that is really hard because we're in the room with the director. I know what he's looking for. Right. I know what he's not looking for. And in this instance, we needed someone who is a comedic engine on their own. Mm -hmm. To be able to improvise. Yes. Like every agent is like, yeah, my client can do that. They're so funny. And most of the time it's situationally comedic, mm -hmm. but not able to just go on their own. Mm -hmm. And if we were to say yes to every single person that their agent said, oh, they can do that, but have nothing to back it up, mm -hmm. we'll be here all day, yeah. <laughs> every day. Yeah. And so I think for the reps that listen, yes. please respect the casting directors. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's sometimes you can push if you really have faith. But if you have no proof Good. that your client can do this, then this is not the time to double down. I just want to then now talk to the actors about yes. what you just said. I think there's this like thing about materials. The materials is just the evidence people need that you can do this. Well, that's the thing. Whether you have professional material or not, this is the thing that I've always said, yeah. because this is what we ask for the reps. If they have nothing to show mm -hmm. case their client mm -hmm. is, do you have a recent self tape of them doing X, Y, and Z mm -hmm. something in this tone? Mm -hmm. And if they don't, I have nothing to go on. That's right. Nothing. Okay. And then it's really, you've got 20 slots of actors that you have the allotted time to see. Mm -hmm. And are you going to give one of those 20 slots away to somebody that doesn't have the evidence, especially when we have all of the abilities to have the evidence. It's not 1993. If you are good at something, put it somewhere so people can see that you're good at it. Otherwise, you are asking for everyone to take a leap of faith in an industry where literally nobody <laughs> needs to take a leap of faith. And there are so many actors. That's why they don't need to. <laughs> they don't need to take a leap but of faith. But just in the instance of like, there are so many of you guys mm -hmm. that we just can't do it for everyone. There's just no, not. there's not enough time in the day. Mm -mm. So we really need one, the respect and two, preparation mm -hmm. of having, if you think you are suited for something, 
make sure you have something on tape that we can see. Yes. Whether it's professional or not. Yes, I agree. So let's talk about your podcast, Mm -hmm. Tipsy Casting, with your dear friend and co-podcaster, Jen Presser, Mm -hmm. who is in London. And I really do love that perspective because, I don't know if you know this, I lived in London and studied in London and am aware of the weird differentiation between London and Los Angeles. And I mean that in maybe a kind way. And so I really love hearing her perspective. I get a lot of actors from the UK and abroad who listen to this podcast who have dreams of coming to the United States and to Los Angeles in specific to pursue acting. So tell me about why you started the podcast and what your intention with the podcast is. The reason why the truth is, Mm -hmm. is that last April, there was that big fiasco with Mary Vernu's office that mm-hmm. they were renting out their studio space, but not actually holding auditions in their space yeah, because of COVID protocols. Mm-hmm. And there were a number of things that were happening back to back, part of the strike, mm-hmm. part of this. Also, actors burnout, I have to say. Yes. This thing of actors getting 12 pages yes. and just never feeling like they could breathe. Yes. And right. that is completely valid. Mm-hmm. But in that process, we were being vilified. We were. And that is above our pay grade. I know. But honestly, like the, I know. the material that is requested, the turnaround times, like those are things that we get to squeeze and then we have to squeeze you guys. And people that were talking about, you know, these horrible things that casting directors were asking for. And a lot of those things were non-union projects and mm-hmm. non-union casting directors mm-hmm. that were not following the, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, but those were the things that were getting publicized by the New York Times, by all these things. A lot of our community got really disheartened especially during COVID, there were so many of us who tried to inspire actors and to keep them afloat. And to, I know Jason Kennedy did like these crazy, like open call challenges. And I was doing generals every Friday with anybody who wanted to sign Mm. up. There were so many of us who had put so much time and energy in like keeping actors mentally healthy as much as you possibly could. Yes. And then at the first opportunity to come after us, Mm -hmm. everybody was turning against us. And so Jen and I decided, you know what, there aren't enough casting directors willing to use their voice Mm -hmm. to talk about our issues. And a lot of things that actors don't realize is that we live parallel lives. We're freelance creatures. We deal with a lot of the same issues. The way that we audition is different, but we still audition for things. There are so many people gatekeeping opportunities from us Mm -hmm. because you see there's like 10 casting directors in the Mm -hmm. U.S., that get all All of the the jobs jobs. Mm -hmm. and they get Mm -hmm. all of the union hours. Mm -hmm. And we're scraping the bottom Mm -hmm. of the barrel to try to negotiate union fringes on tiny indies that can't afford it. And so everybody's banking their insurance hours and we're losing our insurance. And so we understand the actor's turmoil. We really do. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are casting directors that are tired. Yes. And they just should, like actors. You yes. Guys. But like maybe these folks should possibly retire. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Yeah. But those are the names that mm-hmm. actors tend to repeat in terms of their bad experiences. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there's something to be said about that. Mm-hmm. Those are valid. I mean, I witnessed a husband and wife both of them are actors, Mm. talk about their own horrible experiences. And in that moment, realize it was the same cast. (gasps) And I was just like mortified. And this happened like a decade apart. Oh, my God. I was mortified, but also that's got to say something. Yeah. So I understand the reality of an actor's experience, Mm -hmm. but know that there are so many of us that can relate. Well, that's the thing that I really love is I'm such an advocate on the podcast and part of how I like to use the podcast platform is just a greater understanding for actors of the whole picture. Because my experience is the more you understand the whole picture, A, the more you work. And B, you're just part of a group. And there is this camaraderie, humility. There was times when I used to see Kendra Castleberry at a party. Mm. And I would just like turn into a stone. (laughs) And... If anyone knows me, I don't turn into stone. That's not an Audrey move. But it was, I was just like so intimidated and be like, ah, a casting person is here. (laughs) And now that I understand so much of the business in like a multidimensional way, I can see Kendra at a party and just say hi and congratulate her on all the wonderful things that have happened in her life. As you know more about 
what everyone is going through. And the more you understand, like, no, everyone was having that casting. No, we're still having it. I know our, our contracts are negotiated until September. And what I love about listening is really hearing and understanding the business side, because as people know, that's what I focus on here in Audrey Helps Actress Podcast, the business side of what you're dealing with and hearing you and Jen talk about contracts coming through, contracts falling apart. Like that's what we're all dealing with. Writers, mm -hmm. directors, producers, actors, everyone, casting directors are all dealing with this job to job, scraping along, competitive, trying to go above and beyond without burning out or maxing out your credit cards or whatever it is to stay in the game. Yeah. There are so many people in the space of COVID that moved out and left yeah. the business on the casting front, on the actors front, everybody. Yeah, I was like, bye. <laughs> You're like, it's okay. Okay. So tell me about now your intentions going forward with tipsy casting. What do you hope to get out of it in the next year as you're going forward? A big part of it is demystifying the process. Mm -hmm. For us, talking to directors, talking to showrunners, things that we didn't know about mm -hmm. that also educates the actors mm -hmm. that listen. Our big thing has always been to educate producers and directors about Right. our issues mm -hmm. about the fact that if the studio gives you eight names, you can ask for 10, mm. right? Mm -hmm. A lot of, we had Ryle Tucker, who's showrunner. I worked with her on a show called The Returned and she did that Sacred Lies series. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we had a conversation and she was talking about mentorship within her own industry. And she mm. started this program for writers and she was like, you guys should do that for casting. And we basically had to tell her, like, we have no runway. Mm -hmm. We are barely scraping by as it is. Yeah. And we can't be mentors because we don't have any. You don't have any. And so I think for her, that realization that our success, much like actors, mm -hmm. depends on her awareness as a right. showrunner. Of what she can ask for. Yes. Yes. And because all she thought was like, oh, they gave me this list. This is what I have to choose from. Mm. But the truth is, is that the thing that all of these executives tow is that we will never get in the way of a producer's or a director's first choice for a casting director. Mm. Mm. So if they do, it's a problem. Yeah, right. But, you know, for those filmmakers and those showrunners to come to the table knowing that they can ask for people they want or to meet with new people, that's a power they have mm. that they don't know they have. Mm -hmm. So that is something that we're trying to educate people in our space, yes. mm -hmm. but also uncover things that we don't know and that most people don't know. I just think that's great. The more we all know about what all of us is doing, the more we all benefit. Yeah. And what's so great about access to free information is that it allows us all to get experience before we are at the level in which experiences like actually practically taught us that thing. Yeah. So we might get a little insight of what to expect. So I want to talk about casting in terms of budgets, productions, things like that, getting a project off the ground and how casting is a part of that. So we're going to play a game okay. called Inside Out is now a limited series on oh. Disney. Okay. okay. The Pixar movie coming out probably by the time this is released. <laughs> and we're going to say it was such a success. Disney's like, let's do a live action TV show of Inside Out. So I want to talk about just a few characters. So let's take Joy. Joy could be cast any age. So they might come to you and say, we're looking for a 15 year old. And they might come to you and say, we're looking for a 45 year old. Or they might come to you and say like, we're open. Like just give us somebody that exudes joy. Mm -hmm. But joy is like, you know, kind of number one on the call sheet. Are you casting an unknown to play Joy? If the pool is vast mm -hmm. that we are choosing from, mm -hmm. it's ultimately going to depend. In this case, I would imagine, yes, they could be any age, mm -hmm. but you'll likely need someone who's got the layers, mm -hmm. who's got a little bit of experience. Mm -hmm. Babe, I, ju I just refreshed myself and watched <laughs> Inside Out. Good. <laughs> So it's, it's so, so it's good. Uh, it's great. So I think you'd probably skew a little bit older mm -hmm. just based on creative conversations. Yes. But I want to talk about the a little bit older 
because to me, what you said, which I think is so important, is like a level of experience. Mm -hmm. And I think people who don't have a lot of experience don't understand why experience is important. But I'll clarify, not necessarily acting experience, but life experience. Great. So there are two versions of it. There is a version where if it is a younger character, there are certain aspects of the character that are maybe part of underrepresented communities. Great. Then we will do a search. Do like a wide search. Yes. And then they know anger, sadness, Mm -hmm. whoever else is going to be part of this journey. We will build the cast around this person that is part of a search. Right. Right. Yes. If it is the thing that they don't want that version of Uh it, uh we are going to be looking at marquee names. And tell me why, because I want people to understand in terms of financing. So the creators of Inside Out, the TV show, Mm -hmm. do they want it to be successful or unsuccessful? (laughs) Probably successful. They do, right? And so in being successful, they need people to tune in. Mm -hmm. And one of my greatest lessons about that was when I was on the SAG Awards nominating committee. Mm -hmm. And so I got sent like 5,000 movies that year. They just send them to you. And I was like, oh, marketing. Because I didn't have time to watch 5,000 movies. So the ones that I watched were the ones that had buzz. Mm. And there were plenty that probably were very good movies that were sent to me in like these sad little cardboard little (laughs) slides because they didn't have the budget. But they were like, please think of me. But I think there's a difference because when you're starting with a project Mm -hmm. that is an unknown entity, it's different to put a marquee name, to put a face that is recognizable on that packaging. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Because you, in your one of your most recent episodes, you talked about Planet of the Apes. Yes. And how we have Planet of the Apes and they had what you guys called an unknown actor. And I say Pasha, but unknown I mean, she, in the sense yeah. that my mom doesn't know who Correct. she is. It's always the mom test, you guys. She's not going to be, she's a great actor. Great. She has a series on her belt. Yes. Yes. But not a known entity to the middle of America That's or right. the average person. To me, it's a mom test. Yes. Does the mom who watches Grey's Anatomy for the last 20 years know who that actor is by name? And if the answer is no, then they fail the mom test. Mm -hmm. They may pass the Hollywood test, but they fail the mom test. Okay. So you argued that Planet of the Apes itself is such an IP, Mm -hmm. intellectual property for those who aren't aware, that it draws the crowd despite the lack of mom test pass in terms of casting of number one on the call sheet. Yeah. So that's an instance like what you're talking about where the project itself, the hype around what it is, Mm -hmm. is going to lift it up regardless of who you cast as the lead. Correct. However, if you are Disney (laughs) and- Trust me, I know this right now. I know you do. (laughs) I bet you do. If you're Disney and it's inside out, do you have to choose between failing the mom test and intellectual property? This is where I come up against some friction. Right. Because for me, my creative side says that if you cast the right person, Mm. regardless of mom test, you will get recognition for the great performance you will get. Right. Because it's the perfect person for the role. Yes. If you cast the wrong person with a large marquee name Mm -hmm. and it doesn't go well, Mm -hmm. people will be talking about you, but for the wrong reasons. Right. So now, Joy, you could go known or unknown because the IP of Inside Out and Joy is perhaps enough of a sell that people are going to maybe show up because it's a live action version of Inside Out. And no matter how good or bad any of the Disney live actions are, America keeps (laughs) <laughs> showing up. They just do. do. It's just what's happening. So then I want to talk about smaller roles. Mm-hmm. So maybe if it's Joy and it's a 25-year-old, she's not union yet. She just graduated 
from college. She's been in the city for two years. Like she's probably not getting an audition for Joy, right? <laughs> like, I like, think it depends on representation. It depends on representation. And so let's talk about that. Sure. Because let's talk about gatekeepers. If your representation has relationships with casting and is like, I have this person, they are new, but they are really special. Let me show you this tape I have of them being really special and you can see the joy that naturally beams out of their pores, then if it's a agent who has earned a reputation of trust mm -hmm. to be heard and listened to, and you are that 25-year-old actress who is repped by that agent, mm -hmm. then you might get your tape seen. Correct. If you are an agent that nobody's really ever heard of, you know, we'll just say like maybe a little crazy. We all know those agents. We all had them. <laughs> and doesn't have relationships yet, is new on the scene and has an onion actress, 25, and they think she's great. She's got a self-tape that maybe is really fantastic that shows all these things. Um, is her tape getting watched? Here's the difference, I think. The agent who has the relationships mm -hmm. is picking up the phone and making a call. Right. The agent who doesn't is not. And right. they're they're likely not emailing as well. Yes. If they are emailing, this is what the thing that I've experienced this year specifically. Okay. Is that reps that I don't know mm -hmm. are emailing me as if we've known each other for years without mm -hmm. an introduction. You know, this business is a hundred percent based on relationships. Yes. Yes. And I don't mean that in the gatekeeping way, but a big part of it is building not only trust, but also understanding what your taste is as an agent. Yes. And you can have a whole client list of actors that I'm not familiar with, but like if I start bringing them in and I see that they're not ready, right? Mm -hmm. They are not ready to have representation yet. They're not ready to be in the room with casting directors yet. They're still working on their craft. And mm -hmm. every actor is continuously working on their right, craft. I understand what you're saying. But, but to be in that space, to have those opportunities, you're not always ready when you start, right? Listen, I want to just say to everyone, Jessica can ask any casting director that she is friends with about Audrey Moore circa 10 years ago. And I promise you, the answer is she was not ready yet. Her enthusiasm was there. <laughs> Her work ethic was there. Consistency of execution. <laughs> well, honestly, like one of my closest friends, yeah. like I ended up casting his short film yeah. for him. Yeah. I got to see his evolution mm. from someone who had something mm -hmm. but wasn't quite there. And now he sends me his tapes whenever he like does a guest star recurring or series regular. And I'm so impressed with his growth. And I think that's the thing that you have to understand for us is that we're along with you on this journey. Right. It's not a one and done situation. If you don't deliver three or four times for the same office, mm -hmm. they may take a break from right. bringing you in because they think you need some more work. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that they won't bring you back in the future. Mm -hmm. So I think it's understanding that we understand mm -hmm. that you are evolving as a human. You are evolving as a, a performer. Mm -hmm. There are so many aspects of who you are mm. that will grow. Yes. And so it doesn't have to be right now this yes. moment yes like and that's very hard when you're 25 i know i just want everyone to know like i was 25 i understand that it's like very hard because you feel like well i'm ready and then when i would have moments of experiences that really showed me i wasn't mm. and i couldn't deny it it's really devastating but also those are the moments where i put the saddle on the horse and i got back on and i got practicing i got to work i was determined to make that growth happen so speaking of relationships i would like to talk about smaller roles of like the guy that served pizza to riley mm -hmm. you know top of the call sheet and she goes to get some pizza and she's like excited because she thinks it'll make her feel better and then there's a guy that serves her pizza mm -hmm. i don't remember if it was a guy there's a character that serves her pizza broccoli pizza broccoli pizza to be yeah. exact because san francisco <laughs> and riley's horrified now that role obviously could be played by anyone mm -hmm. what are some things that are going to help tell the story of a san francisco person that works at a pizza place that serves broccoli pizza well i think the look is a big part of it so what's the look I don't know. It's a little crunchy, I would guess. Yeah, like a little <laughs> granola, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you'd be looking for whatever like a granola e vibe is yeah. to find broccoli on pizza acceptable. 
Correct. Right. Great. Yes. And <laughs> does this actor need to be known or unknown? Unknown, ideally. I, unknown, ideally. And why? Because their job is to be sort of the organic transition in this moment, not necessarily the thing that will distract you. Great. So we need to believe that this person is a pizza person. Yes. And not going <laughs> to come back and have the story be about the pizza person. Correct. So it's about facilitating the scene rather than distracting from it. And that's right. a big part of the audition process as well. Mm. There are a lot of times that I understand every audition is precious and mm -hmm. it is important and it's maybe few and far between mm -hmm. when you're getting those opportunities. Mm -hmm. But the biggest thing is that you have to make it feel natural and a lot of actors get very excited about it and tend to make a meal out of those lines. Mm -hmm. So when you're auditioning, I think it's great to give two to three options, sure. especially via self-tape, mm -hmm. two to three options yes. that are understanding what your purpose, your serving is. Right. And so to me, that's what's really hard for actors is... Again, nobody understands story. And I'm always talking about story. And it's like my friends who are like show-stopping gorgeous, they had a really hard time with co-stars except for hot girl because they were distracting. Yeah. And they were getting sent out for leads before they were ready for those opportunities. And they're more interesting than just another hot girl, mm -hmm. right? But if you put like somebody smoking hot as the pizza person, then story-wise it's a flag mm -hmm. that says something about the pizza place and or that we're coming back here for some reason in the story. But when I need you to blend, it's because the purpose of this line is not the, the person selling the pizza. The purpose of the line is San Francisco ruined pizza, yeah. <laughs> not the person who sold it but that the pizza is That's destroyed <laughs> by broccoli. Yes. Because F you San Francisco. Right. Right? <laughs> yes. Can you tell me um, where people can find you, follow you, hire you, date you? <laughs> uh, find me mm -hmm. Instagram. I'm very active. It's at jshermy.casting. Spell it because I always like a spelling. J S H E R M Y. I like that you were like a little unconfident about that. Because I, I don't know. I overthink <laughs> things. What do you want? <laughs> okay, great. Okay, good. Yeah. So jshermy.casting. Love. Also tipsy casting. Great. It's just at tipsy casting. Great. All one word. You can also have a website, tipsycastingpodcast.com. A cause for entertainment. You can find me so many places. This is the bottom line. Uh, also jessicashermancasting.com. Great. For the hire me part. Yes. Love it. But also um, you'll take hire me probably on any platform. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. date me probably. Yeah. Like if you're partially financed and have development funds to actually pay a casting director, we all love that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you That's know, right. You know, we got to keep our lights on too. If you've got too. contracts ready, <laughs> she is available. Great. I'm your gal. Love it. <laughs> Wonderful. I always ask people, do you have any questions for me? Where do you get your jumpsuits? Oh God, everywhere. So <laughs> this one, I got downtown with Buckley actually at a repurposing place. You know, I go downtown to the garment district like a lot. Oh, I didn't know. And I get fabric and I have them made often. Oh, you did say that. Girl, yes. I'm, on, I'm too tall for this shop off the rack shit, you know? But this one I actually got with Buckley. We got kind of similar ones at the same store, but they're just like refurbished and then sold for a billion dollars more than whatever they bought them for. But it was such a great color and yeah. fit that I was like, looks great. I was like, let's go. <laughs> okay, great. Last question. Okay. I want to know. This is going to be like a, this is like a weird question. Okay. But this is what every actor wants to ask every casting director. Okay. If I was going to be on my next show, what do you envision that show would be? A comedy. See, people keep saying comedy, but the problem is there was this gap mm -hmm. where I had an agent that didn't have any comedy representation in terms of like nobody brought their people in for comedy. Okay. And so I had like this gap where then I suddenly didn't go in for comedies. Then everyone else in my group did. Mm. And so I used to only book comedies. And then when I switched to this agent, I only booked dramas. And I've pretty much been only booking dramas since then. And my friends who know me are like, the fact that you don't audition for comedy is just like bonkers town. But now I feel like resume wise... I don't have... But you have great relationships with casting directors. I don't know what to tell you, but 
it goes above casting directors heads as you know and so but i think if you know comedy casting directors you and they know you and right. your sensibility yes that should be enough it should to at least get the audition should is my favorite word you know <laughs> in my space I can speak for myself Great. that if I were working on a comedy and I know your sensibility right. and that you're a funny lady, yes, I would bring you in for it. What about a comedy role on a drama? That exists. Yes. We hired for Tell Me Your Secrets, mm -hmm. Mary Birdsong. Oh, yes. To play Hamish Linklater's fucked up sister great i don't know if i'm allowed to curse here but yes yes we are well yes explicit. we do right. yes yes so and she like the nature of the character was supposed to have comedic mm -hmm. abilities mm -hmm. but not a comedy right not character. only yes. like a clear comedy character. she just had to be like real off the wall yeah and we needed someone who could bring that comedic inspiration without right. being haha -ha funny yeah, I mean, I feel like that's mostly in dramas. I either book like the saddest person on earth <laughs> or I book the characters that it's in a drama, but just because I'm all a weirdo, it brings a little levity yeah. to what is otherwise. We're talking like the Bob Odenkirk world. Yeah. Right? Like a little levity to, to a very serious place. To a very serious place. Yeah. yeah. I like that I inserted my own answer into the answer. <laughs> but, just... but I feel like mm. if you have the relationships and you have someone pushing you to mm -hmm. more comedic casting directors, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be as difficult. No, see, Erica said the same thing. She's like, you're so funny. Why don't you go out for comedy? And I was like, it's too late for me. It's not. It's never too late. It's never too late. I have so much personality, you guys. <laughs> so much to Okay, great. Okay, so lastly, you get to pick out a plushie to take home. <gasps> Really? And you can pick out out of either side, but the deal is you have 20 seconds to pick out a plushie and yeah. you have to then <laughs> come back and sit down and introduce your plushie and tell us which one you picked. Do I tell you why I picked them? Sure. Okay. Love it. Let me just take a quick gander. Take a little gander. Okay. Okay, go. Ah, I love it. Okay, great. Oh my God, I'm so excited to find out which one you picked. I'm going to keep a blind eye so I can find out. Oh my gosh, you did the grilled cheese sandwich. Oh my gosh. Okay, everyone, Jessica picked a grilled cheese sandwich, a squishmallow. So tell me about your choice. <laughs> this is Gouda toast. And <laughs> there's, there's only Gouda about the Gouda toast. I mean... <laughs> It's my favorite thing about She's the Man, where he talks about Gouda. What kind of cheese do you like? Gouda. So this is a little bit of an inside joke Love. Uh, Love. with my associate that I Great. just had. That she has a bread loaf pillow. Oh my god! So I've seen the bread loaf yes. pillow and almost bought it. I actually, so I saw it in her home yeah. because of Zoom. Yes, it was always behind her, and then. I saw it on an episode of The Circle. Yes. I uh, love that you're watching The Circle. Yes. Girl, you and me got to watch trashy television. Uh, I'm here for you it. You know, I don't do a lot, but there are a few that well, I do. What you do matters. I do. <laughs> Circle, Bachelor franchise, yes. and Love is Blind. Love is Blind. Yeah. You and I could do a whole segment of that. show about <gasps> Love is Blind. Yes. We would get great. really popular if, <laughs> with our Love is Blind commentary. Uh -huh. But yeah, so they had it on The Circle, and I just saw toast behind you, and I wanted it. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I just love it. Now, Gouda Toast, do you feel comfortable naming Gouda Toast in the moment or do you need some time with Gouda Toast? I might have to come back. To okay, great. But Gouda I'm... in the moment, it, it felt good. No, I think it's great. Okay, good. I love Gouda Toast. Okay. Got some laughs out there, you know. Well, listen, I truly love and adore you. And one of the things that is the best part about this industry, and I don't know how many other industries you can say this about, is Jesse and I always feel so lucky to have met so many incredible people, like just here in town. I agree. Right? Yeah. People that are not only talented, but also, God, their heart is in the right place. And just like good people, good, chill, like with the right thoughtful. amount of crazy. But thoughtful. But thoughtful, caring, yeah. empathetic, yeah. and capable people. And so getting to know you over these last few years and learning more and more about you has been a real treat. And so uh, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. I'm just thrilled. Can we do a little tipsy casting cheers? Tipsy casting cheers! <laughs> Again, in Spain, where you are, hopefully right now. Oh, God. She's back from Spain. Back from Spain. <laughs> Cheers to you. Cheers to Jess. Um, may you be slammed with contracts. <laughs> 
and incredible financing. Yes. And you too. Thank you. Thank you. Next week on Audrey Helps Actors, we have David Rosenblatt. Woo! David's so great. He did six self tape made challenges. Special shout out thanks to Jessica Sherman. I adore you. This episode was mixed and mastered by Thomas Hank Snodgrass. He loves to surf. Hang 10, buddy. Hang that 10. It was produced by my incredible producer slash husband, Jesse Lumen, still so handsome. What is wrong with you? Why? It is not fair. It's appreciated. I appreciate it. Like I appreciate it. But also why this episode was edited by Matthew Patrick Davis. Show music by Ari De Niro. Theme song by Alok Mehta and 108 Hill. And most importantly, don't forget your talent. When somebody's trying to body shame you, you tell them to go themselves. Special thanks to Casting Networks for sponsoring this episode. A new feature they're offering is called Thrive. Thrive that gives you health benefits. Thrive benefits include telemedicine with behavioral health. Enjoy unlimited access to telemedicine and behavioral health services, saving an average of $564 from medical and mental health care per year. It will get you up to 80% off on prescriptions. You can also save on offers on home health testing, medication delivery, virtual consultations. Oh my God, please make health easier. Save 25% on most let's get checked tests. The best part, it's free. It's free. It's frizzle free. My favorite price free for premium members who are based in the US and over 18. Go to casting networks.com slash Audrey for your promo code Audrey CN for $65 off. I mean, look, you're going to get access to discounts on your health and discounts on your career. That's just magical. All right, everyone book it. Also take care of your health.